demographics of the survey. Now I'd like you to focus on the section that is highlighted blue and what we've called the adult pop projection, population projection. Now that, that is the official census data for Ghana and you can see that our sample closely uh, mirrors that. I'll just highlight a few things in that demographic. So we have urban in our sample 53% and rural 47%. Now we had towns and villages covered in the EAs. The EAs is what we call the enumeration area of 199 and so on. The age, so our sample of course covers you know, the demographics, the social demographics of our society. So the age range as you can see, over 50% or 50% falls within the young, what we call the youth of the country, so 18 to 35 years. The highest, the oldest person uh, was 102 years old, the youngest person, of course, 18 years. For the gender distribution, because we practice what we call the gender alternation, we usually have a 50-50 split in our survey sample. So moving on with the demographics, the sample also covers the educational sector as well. As you can see, the highest in the sample is junior high school at 29%, followed by senior high, high school. Of course, this um, collaborates with the demographics, or the age demographics. It covers the religious sect as well, so 80% were Christians and 16% Islam and 2% traditional and 1% nothing at all. For employment, uh, we have 23% of those who have no job and are not looking for a job and 16% who have a job and are looking for a job, and 50% have a full-time job, and 11% uh, have a part-time job. Still on the demographics, we have the various um, occupations. So you see that, again, the highest is in the agricultural area and the retail area. So 50% of our sample falls within the agricultural fishery area and then the retail trader vendor area, only 2% are in the so-called upper professional level. So, okay, so I think Kujo um, did uh, mention a few things about the, the survey while we decided to collect the data. And so I'll just highlight one or two things. That again, we wanted to get an interpretation from citizens of the outcome of the elections, of course, we all know how the election turned out. We had a few surprises there. We also wanted to see the expectations of the likely, their views on the expectation of the likely hung parliament, the expectations of the likely impact of an NDC speaker of parliament, and the expectations regarding the performance of the MPP government in the next four years. So these were generally the questions that we wanted citizens to give us their opinions on. And so the findings will mainly revolve around those questions. So now to the findings. All right, so um, one of the first issues that I thought we thought we should present was the perceptions about the reduction in the president's uh, vote margin because in 2016 he did get something and in 2020 reduced marginally. So we see that a cumulative 58% attribute the reduction in the president's vote margin to his policy decisions and actions his MPs and appointees' performance in, and, the pres and the president's own performance. So people are laying the blame squarely on the president and his appointees' uh, laps as to why he got a reduced uh, vote in the 2020 elections. We also wanted to find out the same about the, um, the, uh, the parliamentary uh, seats because it, the MPP did lose a number of parliamentary seats. Again, respond, res re respondents attribute the loss of their seats uh, to the, their non-performance, which is a, the parliamentarians, and non-performance, bad campaign, and the non-performance of candidates who were already in parliament. So this is the attribution uh, our respondents ascribe to why the MPP lost the number of seats they lost in the 2020 election. Of course, we wanted to find out why the NDC got seats as opposed to what they got in 2016. Again, our, respond, our respondents attribute the gains the NDC made in the parliamentary elections to the MPP's non-performance, their MPs' non-performance, and the NDC's own campaign, and the performance of their candidates during the campaign um, process. And also, they wanted to punish the MPP for non-performance. 
to be asked questions about, you know, the efficacy of the elections and all of that. But we thought, you know, we moved away from, you know, election time, so there was no need. So I'm moving straight down to what uh, citizens feel about governance. So again, the regarding the prospective evaluation of government service delivery, in general, we see that a significant minority of Ghanaians are optimistic that in the next four years, the Nanado MPP-led government will perform much better or better in addressing public social delivery services, but are less optimi optimistic about the government's ability to reduce crime, and they are also less opti optimistic about the government's ability to fight corruption and ability to promote collaboration between the ruling opposition party and his party. So what are some of the expected changes in management of some matters by government in the second term? Again, we see that in general, most Ghanaians expect changes in the way that Kufuado led MPP government will handle a number of national development issues in the next four years. So for instance, you see that 70% are saying that they are optimistic that the provision of education infrastructure will meet and, and, and to meet the free SHS needs uh, will, will be, will, will, the government will meet those expectations. We also see that um, citizens are optimistic that fixing roads and infrastructure, the, 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 the expected changes that, I, that would occur in those areas would, would be met. Also, fighting illegal small-scale mining, you know, people are expecting that there will be a few changes in the, how that is handled. Again, all the way down to is only when it gets to dealing with official appointees alleged to be involved in corruption that citizens don't think that there will be any significant changes in how those are managed. So what is the confidence in government's ability to fulfill its 2020 manifesto pledges? And as Kojo said, we are still in the <laughs> manifesto season. I mean, the, the government just started. It's not even a year old. So we see that whilst um, there's confidence in ability to fulfill some of the MPP's 2020 manifesto promises, there are also mixed feelings about that. So we see that there's almost a near split for when it gets to extending electricity to cover the entire population. The people are not sure that the government can meet that manifesto promise. It's when it gets to the consolidation of the free SHS policy that we see just a marginal um, majority saying that they are sure the government will, you know, fulfill these promises there. Again, when it comes to reopening the MMDC election on partisan line as pledged in the manifesto, you know, citizens are almost split there. They are not sure that the government can fulfill that manifesto promise. And again, you know, the highest there in terms of negative attribution to whether the government can fulfill that promise is the expansion of the one district, one factory initiative across the country as pledged by the MPP. So Ghanaians don't think that is mainly possible in the next four years. So again, um, confidence in government's ability to promote rule of law and financial accountability. Whilst Ghanaians are split in their opinion on government's ability to ensure that this rule of, rule of law is upheld, majority are not confident in the ability of Nanado, Nanado's government to protect the financial resources and keep corruption in the next four years. So again, you can see that 62% of that's the highest so far uh, in terms of people's views about whether corruption can be kept in the next four years. Again, still on the government's confidence in uh, confidence in the ability of the government to consolidate and expand policy initiatives, we see that there's an equally split, uh, an equal split of respondents in their confidence in the government's ability to consolidate the gains in the planting, rearing for food and job programs in the next four years. But the majority express lack of confidence in government's ability to expand the one one million dollar per constituency initiative. That's a whooping 60, 61% are saying that they don't think that the one million per dollar constituency initiative will be fulfilled. So in view of all this, what are the priorities that um, citizens are expecting government to pay attention to? 
Um, as in many, many of our surveys, except the pre-election survey that we, we conducted uh, last year, um, unemployment has topped that list again, followed by infrastructure and roads. Education comes in third. Manage, manage, management of the economy comes in um, fourth, and then health third, which is a little surprising in view of the fact that we are in, still in a pandemic. But these are the top uh, priorities that citizens are saying that the government should pay attention to. And so, well, if, if these are the priorities, what, why, where should resources be allocated? Again, we asked citizens the priority for additional government investment. Again, we see inf education up there, infrastructure, healthcare, and agriculture as the four areas that Ghanaians actually recommend for additional investment in case government wants to increase um, spending. Again, um, so I, I am a little concerned about the bottom five. Sanitation is there given the fact that is one of the issues that has been in the, on the agenda, of course, for the government as well, keeping Accra, making Accra the cleanest city, for instance, but there's no alignment with what citizens are expecting. Okay, so um, like we said in the beginning, one of the areas that we wanted to um, get some sense from Ghanaians, because this is the first time this is happening in Ghana, what's the expectation of Ghanaians of the eighth parliament? So we'll, we'll look at a few, a, few, a few questions there as well. So again, we, we asked you know, what the impact of the current hang parliament meant to Ghanaians, and most of them expect the composition of parliament to impact on some parliamentary practices function and government business program. So again, you see that 80%, almost 8 in 10 throughout, are saying that it will force or ensure full attendance uh, by MPs when parliament sits. It will improve the practice of parliamentary democracy. It will keep the executive in check. It is only when, I guess, to aid scrutiny of international contracts that we see that is now drops to about 6.9. I wouldn't even say 10, 7 in 10. <laughs> so uh, 7 in 10 think uh, that, again, these are areas where we need to pay attention to, especially those of us who um, work with Parliament. And then, again, on the expected, and it, it keeps going down. So still on the expected hang Parliament, again, we see a drop in um, that it will slow down decision making. Um, again, it's, we see a drop, it's now six in 10, saying that it will make MPs connive more on issues that affect them. And then it drops again when it gets to, to disrupt the MPP government's business and agenda. So Ghanaians are not really thinking so. And then um, next is it will make business persons unsure of outcome of, of outcome government, of the outcome of government policies and programs. And then those, there are 33%, which is quite significant, who say they do not know what difference it makes. Okay, so now to the question of having an opposition member as Speaker of Parliament. Again, a majority of Ghanaians believe the election of an opposition NDC Speaker of Parliament will make the President and government more transparent and also promote NDC MPP uh, collaboration and, 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 and cooperation. So you see that 71, almost 7 in 10 throughout are saying that uh, they expect some cooperation. Okay, so again, as I said, the vetting was ongoing whilst we were collecting the data. And so we see that significant minorities of Ghanaians cannot rate the various aspects of the 2021 ministerial nominees vetting. And we think this is a case of a sizable number of Ghanaians lacking the knowledge of what transpired uh, during the vetting um, process. So we, you can see the low numbers um, there. We also wanted to see if there was any difference between the vetting of 2017 and the vetting of uh, 2021. Again, we see that there's a significant minority could not offer any meaningful comparative evaluation of both vetting processes. And that also speaks volumes about whether, you know, when people are watching the vetting on TV, it, the, who, who is watching and who is literate enough to understand uh, what is going on. You might uh, wonder, oh, there's so much talk about it, maybe on social media, but is everybody really paying attention? So um, 
I will end with a few um, findings about citizen expectation of public office holders and then what um, we expect citizens to do because of course governance is a two-way stream, it's not one-sided. So we asked you know, our respondents to tell us you know, what the public life standards of a politician and public officers should be. And Ghanaians expect um, politicians and public of officials to, to be accountable to their actions, for their actions, and show integrity in their work. Be honest, respectful, and competent. Of course, you would see that the, the percentages are a little small, but when you roll all of it together, you can tell who a Ghanaian is looking for as a public office holder. So on the other side, so what can citizens do to ensure responsive accountability? Um, so we asked you know, our respondents what ordinary citizens' actions they can take or engage in to make political leaders do the right thing. Again, can they, we see that Ghanaians expressed mixed opinions on the extent to which certain democratic engagements or actions by ordinary citizens can elicit appropriate actions from political leaders to meet citizens' expectations. And again, you see that the highest there is what we call vertical accountability. So voting out, uh, voting against for a political party that is airing, um, that the airing official belongs to. So we've seen heavily here that, you know, uh, people are increasingly believing in the efficacy of their vote, that their vote can really change bad leadership. And that is followed by joining others in the community to demand government action. Um, and then so on and so forth, contacting the media by calling to a radio station program, for instance, and participating in demonstrations and protest marches. Um, but at least on the uh, items that ordinary citizens uh, think they can engage in to make their political leaders act right, is taking legal action in court. So that's the least, followed by refusing to pay taxes. They don't think that <laughs> if they pay taxes and fees owed to government, that would change anything.